Thank you, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, I am indeed a year-round island resident, but I have the daunting task of introducing Professor Henry Louis Gates, Jr. on what feels like his home turf. <clears throat> so I'll keep it brief to keep myself from floundering. Um, Skip Gates, as many of you already know, ocu occupies a singular place in American letters, uh, in the media, and in the academy. Um, as the person perhaps most responsible for forcing Americans to confront and grapple with their past, with the history of slavery and race in America, and with the complicated legacies and realities of race and racism in the present. He has accomplished this across nearly all forms of media, films, books, radio, and television, as author or co-author of 22 books and creator of 18 documentary films, including Finding Your Roots and a six-part PBS documentary, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. And most importantly, perhaps, he has introduced new characters, new voices, and new ideas into our public discussion, enriching and complicating how we talk about America in the 21st century. Anyone who has followed his academic career, most recently as Alphonse Fletcher University professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, also knows that Skip is an institution builder, someone who creates spaces for other scholars, writers, and artists to pursue their own groundbreaking inquiries. And I would say that part of Skip's institution building extends to this very island, for the vineyard in summer would not be the same without his presence. As I am sure many of you know, the annual Whaling Church event organized by Skip and the Hutchins Center is the main event for many of us, with all due respect to the book festival. Um, <laughs> the thing that makes Martha's Vineyard not only a place for summer frolicking, but also where people come together to listen and debate the ideas of vital importance for our democracy. So what better place to hear about Skip's latest and painfully timely book, Stony the Road, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, and the Rise of Jim Crow. The Boston Globe recently said this about Stony the Road, if anyone wants to understand how the groundbreaking election of Barack Obama as this nation's first black president was answered with Donald Trump's feral white nationalism, Gates has provided a roadmap. With episodes of white terrorist violence exploding around us, this is a map we need more than ever. And like you, I'm eager to hear more about this book, and I'm thrilled to present Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Thank you. On the evening of June 17, 2015, a stranger walked into an historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina, known as Mother Emmanuel. He prayed with the Wednesday night Bible study group for almost an hour. Then, he opened fire. We have nine victims, and I do believe this was a hate crime. Friends say the 21-year-old high school dropout was a loner, an unabashed racist with a deep hatred for black people. He just said, I have to do it. He said, you rape our women and you're taking over our country. The massacre in Charleston touched off not only a debate over the Confederate flag, but it touched off a debate all over the country. How did we get here and why is this happening? It was easy, I guess, to think of that as a singular horror. And it was convenient, I think, to think of it that way. Unless you really wanted to understand how this could happen. And then that meant that you had to get into the history. Most of us know that our country fought a civil war in the 1860s. But less is known about what came afterward, the chaotic, exhilarating, and ultimately devastating period known as Reconstruction. If we're looking for the roots of the tragedy at Mother Emanuel, this is where we have to start. The Reconstruction period is one of extraordinary excitement. A time when America could finally become that land of freedom that it had promised to be since the very beginning. Black people actually sat in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Poor whites and black people saw a common cause with one another. 
You're seeing this opportunity and imagining that will only get better. And looking back, what we know is those black folks had no idea of the cliff that they were heading towards. We do not come here begging for our rights. We come here clothed in the garb of American citizenship. We come demanding our rights in the name of justice. Richard Kane could capture an audience. I think all his years in the pulpit made him a really good speaker in the House. He stood up to the white supremacists who were basically calling him you know, inferior. And he said, look at me, I have two eyes, I have two ears, I have two hands, I have two feet. How are we different when it comes to our manhood? I was amazed when I began to read the speeches of black congressmen in that period. I mean, here are people who are arguing about what the laws of the nation will provide in terms of human rights and have sophisticated understanding of the underlying principles that make these freedoms necessary in a democratic society. The level of discourse was so far above the level of discourse in Congress today. It was shocking. In state houses across the South, black men and white men were attempting to govern together for the first time. In South Carolina, where African Americans made up almost 60% of the population, voters elected a black majority House of Representatives. It was the seat of black power in USA. The Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, mm -hmm. State Treasurer. Unimaginable uh, today. Absolutely. Right. Many parts of the South didn't have a educated and experienced black leadership ready to step into power, which you did have in South Carolina. It had a free black group before the Civil War in Charleston, which was well-educated and politically articulate. Behind us lie 243 years of suffering, anguish, and degradation. Before us lies our mighty future. That future is ours to shape. Robert Brown Elliott was very ambitious. He was educated as a lawyer. He had a photographic memory. He was absolutely fearless. It's hard to imagine more daunting challenges than all these governments have. Some parts of the South had really been devastated by war. So you've got to try to build a forward-looking government at a time where there are very few resources. The state legislatures create public schools, public hospitals, public welfare systems in a way that hadn't been seen in the South. Black men go into these legislatures with an idea of how they're going to improve their communities. One of the most important things they do is to establish free public schools. There were no public education systems in most of the southern states. If you had money to buy it for your children, you had it. If you didn't, well, you did without. And you start to see state constitutions adopting some policy that says education is a right. And this is providing it for all children. One of the most tragic aspects of Reconstruction is that the more African Americans achieve, the more they put their lives at risk. I could hear the noise of the horses. They Ku Klux my house. They had on white gowns, masks on their faces. 75 men. They were Ku Klux. They tore her clothes off. I was blindfolded. Cut me with knives. They whipped me. They, they, whipped, they whipped me. Put a rope around my neck to hang me. Southern Democrats used violence and terror tactics to disrupt Republican control and plot their return to power. They saw themselves as the redeemers of their states. Violence is efficient, it's easy, it's fast, and you can often do it under the cover of night. Clan attacks become so pervasive because that's how widespread the fear of black enfranchisement is. The Klan is actually committing atrocities against everyone. They're attacking freedmen and white Southerners who were sympathetic to the Union cause and to the Republican Party. To their eyes, emancipation was wrong. 
They are washing the South with blood to redeem it. This isn't simply a question of trying to return to an earlier way of life. This is actually a political counter-revolution. Twelve years after the end of the Civil War, Reconstruction was dealt a devastating blow. You might even say it was overthrown. The Southern Democrats took their states back one by one. The 1880s is a kind of a twilight zone between Reconstruction and the full implementation of the Jim Crow system. Black people continued to vote in many parts of the South. There was still violence against them, but there were still some black people holding office in many parts of the South. Civil rights laws remained on the books. One of the cruel ironies of Reconstruction is that black people could claim certain rights in the 1870s that they would have to fight to reclaim in the 1960s. Thanks to the Civil Rights Act of 1875, African Americans were guaranteed equal access to hotels, restaurants, theaters, and public transportation. Those who were denied service could expect their rights to be upheld in a court of law. But all that was about to change. Ida B. Wells, a child of slavery and reconstruction, taught in a segregated school outside Memphis, Tennessee. Being denied access to the all-white first-class car on a railroad trip would propel her to the front lines of civil rights activism. One day, while riding back to my school, I took a seat in the ladies' coach of the train, as usual. The conductor came along to collect tickets. He told me I would have to go in the other car. I refused. He tried to drag me out of the seat. I fastened my teeth in the back of his hand. He got the baggage man to help him, and they succeeded in dragging me out. White ladies and gentlemen stood on the seats applauding the conductor for his brave stand. She challenges segregation on public transportation decades before we would ever hear the name Rosa Parks. She sued, she won in the lower courts, but the railroad appealed the decision and when the court case went to the Tennessee State Supreme Court, Ida B. Wells lost. W.E.B. Du Bois summarized Reconstruction in one sentence. The slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then moved back again towards slavery. Yet African Americans had tasted freedom. They had begun to acquire land, build schools, and create social institutions of their own. And though the tide was turning, they refused to give up on the promise of Reconstruction. Starting in 1890, every southern state writes a new constitution or passes new laws that deprive black men of the vote without actually saying the phrase race or Negro or colored. The South goes from a time in which black and white men are voting in very large numbers to in a very short period of time where they are not. We call that disfranchisement. Other southern states took their cue from Mississippi. Voter suppression tactics included literacy tests, poll taxes, and the requirement that potential voters demonstrate that they understood the state constitution. Their combined effect was so successful that they depressed not just the black vote, but the poor white vote as well. When we're looking at this in the current context, things like voter IDs, the diminishing number of polling places that strategically coincide with communities where African Americans are located, it's not hard to see a connection uh, between these things. The disenfranchisement of African Americans in the decades after Reconstruction didn't exist in a vacuum. Propaganda campaign to rehabilitate the reputation of the South commenced almost as soon as the Civil War was over with the publication of a book called The Lost Cause. The Lost Cause argued that the intentions of the Confederacy 
had been righteous and admirable in spite of its military defeat. 30 years after the war, this idea took on a new life. The lost cause became the ideological justification for white supremacy. Get to the 1890s. The lost cause became not about loss at all. It became a new kind of narrative about the victory over Reconstruction. There's a kind of entire mythology associated with what Reconstruction was attempting to do, that it involved the subordination of the white population by the black population, that the Reconstruction legislators were ignorant, venal, or worse, predatory. The Dunning School, for example, named for a Columbia University professor who was hell-bent on proving the point that black people were incapable of self-governance and that Reconstruction had been a big failure and a big fiasco. It was all wrong. You know, so it becomes this way of justifying and making a case for why you need Jim Crow. The Jim Crow system isn't just a series of laws. It's a set of beliefs, philosophies, attitudes, and even stone monuments. Mitch Landrieu was the mayor of New Orleans between 2010 and 2018. He made a bold, quite controversial decision to remove the Confederate monuments from the city. There were four of these Confederate monument, three in New Orleans, and then there was one to the Klan. Who brought the existence of these statues first to your attention and the fact that they were problematic? Well, it was my really dear friend who I grew up with, Wynton Marcellus. He said, do you know that Louis Armstrong left this city because of that statue? Hmm. Or he said, because of the attitude that allowed that statue to stand up. I started to do research, like well, who owns the monuments? Who put them up? I learned that they were put up as a political message mm -hmm. by the Daughters of the Confederacy. They wanted to tell the story that the lost cause was a noble cause, mm -hmm. to preserve the South as it was, which at that time, as you know, had people of color enslaved. So that's when I called, went back, and I said, we, we need to do this. How difficult was it? It was painful. It was awful. They firebombed the car of the first contractor. We're, we're, in the, we're in the second decade of the 21st century now. <laughs> wow. They firebombed his car. And the people that were taking it out there put masks on because they would get death threats. Mitch, did the vitriol that you encountered, the depth of the vitriol surprise you? Yeah, shocked me, actually. I was, it saddened me. And, and uh, I was sad for our country. Well, how do you reconcile your own Southern identity with history? I mean, slavery is the worst thing that's happened in this country. As a Southerner, I kind of get tired of the rest of the country looking down on us, saying everybody down there is backward and racist and can't read and write. That's not who we are. Mm -mm. But we have to confront the truth, which is what the Civil War was designed to destroy the country over the cause of slavery. It is not a condemnation. It is a reckoning of how we can get better over time, and we can't do it if we don't recognize that what we did in the past was wrong. Confederate monuments were only one form of lost cause propaganda that spread across the South in the 1890s. Even more important was retelling and revising the story of slavery itself. You get a proliferation now of images of slavery which are more nostalgic. The lithograph printmakers publishing images of the old plantation with happy children, you know, black children playing and an older guy playing a banjo. There's an incredible romantic idea that during the Grand Old South, when African Americans were slaves, they were prosperous, they were happy, they were joyful, they had everything provided for them. In reality, it's a story that's very much grounded in rape and torture and exploitation, but became a story of familial love. The happy slave, the bumbling simpleton, the dangerous predator. Racist stereotypes of African Americans came in all shapes and sizes and in vivid color. Newly developed mass printing techniques 
meant that an unprecedented number of demeaning images of black people could saturate American popular culture. The architects of Jim Crow used popular culture and in cartoons all over magazines. You had uh, large-lipped, uh, black-faced, near-human beings portrayed in every kind. Sometimes they were portrayed as animals. Advertising images were circulated in the popular media outside of the black community that showed demeaning images of the black body as undesirable. So if you want to sell soap, you want to be a clean white person. You don't want to be like these dim-witted Africans as they're arguing in these stereotypes. Then you want to buy these specific brands. It was a popular cultural use of and denigration in a thousand ways of the humanity of black people. By 1915, with propaganda like the birth of a nation now accepted as historical fact, black people had little hope for equal rights. Their moment in the sun had long passed and the shadows were growing longer. But they never abandoned the hope that burned brightly in the earliest years of their emancipation. If you say Reconstruction was an attempt to remake American society on the basis of equality, well, it didn't succeed in the long term. But it's very important to look at the agency of slaves, men, women, who seized the opportunity presented by the Civil War to push forward their own aspirations. It's African Americans and radical whites who imagine a different sort of world, who make the high-minded arguments for citizenship, for civil rights, for democracy. People like Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, knew that they were talented and fully the equal of whites, and they just could not accept this sort of second-class citizenship, and each generation would kind of come to this conclusion again and again, and they would keep on fighting. I think once we've tasted freedom, once we've experienced freedom, once we've been able to see our agency actually create schools and laws, it drives a constant willingness to continue to sacrifice, to continue to agitate, to continue to demand that which you have experienced. When we look around the world today, we see dynamics and elements of inequality and we need to have an explanation for it. If you don't know the history of Reconstruction, if you don't know what was tried and then dismantled, then your inference about why we still have these problems is it's a problem with the people. It's a problem with their work ethic, their family structure, their values, rather than it's a problem of an unfinished revolution, which Reconstruction was. If we define Reconstruction as the process by which our country tried to come to terms with the abolition of slavery, you might say it never ended because we Americans are still grappling with what it means to be a truly multiracial society with genuine equality for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay in the back? Um, thank you, Mark, for that marvelous introduction. Thanks to so many of my homies, <laughs> my summer homies, for coming out. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, this film comes out of the book that I wrote, Stony the Road. And um, I wanted to give you an overview of the film as a four hour series. But before we do so, um, I want to explain one of the ironic uh, happenstance ways 
that explains why I'm standing here and I, why I'm able to live the life that I live today. I was 10 years old. Uh, it was 1961, and I was watching our little 12-inch black and white RCA Victor television set. And there was a um, young, beautiful black woman being escorted through a line of vicious people shouting the worst kind of racial epithets. And there was a man protecting her, noble man. I never remember, I never forget. He was tall and he was erect. He had a, a beautiful haircut. We called it a quo vadis back in the day, which very short and razor, um, razor edge cut and his suit. I could even in that little black and white TV set see how impeccably dressed he was. But more, he just evinced self-confidence, courage, power, determination. And as the song said, he wasn't gonna let nobody turn Charlene Hunter around. And I remember thinking, my daddy said, that, that, young, that young boy, my father would <laughs> be 110 today, said that young boy, meaning that lawyer, went to Howard University, three generations of my family at this point had gone to Howard University. And he said, I want you to be a lawyer. And that man was Vernon Jordan, who's sitting right back there. <laughs> and one day after President Bill Clinton was elected president, my family started coming to the vineyard in 1981. And, you know, we didn't have any money. We would stay at, uh, for a week, if we could afford it, first a week, uh, at one rental, then move, you know, slept over two little kids to another. Then eventually we moved up in uh, economic security. And, you know, one day I get this invitation to come to dinner with Vernon and Ann Jordan at the Bridge House. Now some of you know the Bridge House. In, uh, out here, Menemsha, when you go down the hill, you see Quitsa Pond on the left and the Atlantic on the right. It's a magical spot. I think it's the most beautiful area of the vineyard. And you know, I'm an Oak Bluffs man now, I live in West Tisbury. I love all parts, I love all parts of the vineyard, depending on where I am at that particular time. <laughs> so we drive up here and everybody's parked right here. Um, at the library in the community center and they take buses. I didn't know what was going on. And we get down to the bridge house and it was a celebration of the first birthday on the island of the president of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. And I found myself seated between Hillary Clinton and Carly Simon and I said, that young man uh, who escorted uh, Charlene Hunter in 1961 is one bad dude. <laughs> so I'd like to thank uh, Vernon Jordan for all his love and inspiration and friendship. Uh, he is a person that I deeply admired and consider. I trust Vernon. I wouldn't make a move in my career without asking him his opinion and whether I liked it or not, following his advice. <laughs> but give it up one more time for Vernon Jordan. So why Reconstruction and why now? Reconstruction, as we just saw, was a period following the Civil War between 1865 and 1877 when black people experienced more rights and freedom than at any other time in American history. It was the epitome of Lincoln's, remember the second inaugural, the new birth of freedom. Historians call it America's second founding. And most schools today don't even teach about Reconstruction. In my school, in Piedmont, West Virginia, which was integrated, we called it Negro Day. We did everything in a black history curriculum in one day, generally in one hour. And the, essentially the note was, the biggest favor ever happened to Africans was being shipped over here to, in, to the University of Slavery <laughs> and uh, being educated and civilized in the West. And then there was this dark period following the Civil War when they were given their rights too soon. 
and made an embarrassment of the Reconstruction period. Most schools skip from Lee's surrender at Appomattox straight to Rosa Parks, Dr. King, and the Civil Rights Movement, leaving a lot of students wondering, if Lincoln freed the slaves, why do we need a Civil Rights Movement? So after celebrating the triumphs black people made under Reconstruction in the first two hours of the series, we ask, how could black men, and remember, only black men were given the right to vote, because women couldn't vote, how could black men be given the vote in 1866, 1867 throughout 10 of the 11 Confederate states, and 1870 nationally, because, ladies and gentlemen, black men in the North couldn't vote. Black men in the North could only vote in the five New England states and the state of New York if you satisfied a $250 property requirement until the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Ironically, former illiterate black men in the South got the right to vote three years before free, educated, um, been in the North. It just shows you race relations are a lot more complicated than the cartoon version that we're, uh, we often see on TV or, or given in the schools. But how could black men in the South be given the right to vote in 1867 and then 20 years later be systematically denied by state constitutional conventions throughout the South? How could America fight our costliest war in our history the cost of 750,000 lives, yet see Jim Crow established as a law of the land by the Supreme Court of the United States and other forms of economic neo-slavery, called sharecropping, effectively creating a de facto apartheid state just 31 years after the end of the Civil War. As you heard me say, the great Dr. Du Bois, who wrote a corrective, his major work of scholarship, published in 1935 was to correct all of the myths and lies about um, the black participation in Reconstruction. It was called Black Reconstruction. And the epigraph of his book is, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then moved back again towards slavery. A month before he died, and this is something almost no scholar knows, a month before he died, none other than Martin Luther King Jr himself on what would have been Dr. Du Bois's 100th birthday made a speech about Reconstruction and the significance of Dr. Du Bois's book about Reconstruction. And I want to share this quote with you. <clears throat> to understand, he said, why his study of the Reconstruction was a monumental achievement, it's necessary to see it in context. White historians had, for a century, crudely distorted the Negro's role in the Reconstruction years. It was a conscious and deliberate manipulation of history, Dr. King said, and the stakes were high. The Reconstruction was a period in which black men had a small measure of freedom of action. If, as white historians tell it, Negroes wallowed in corruption, opportunism, displayed spectacular stupidity, were wanton, evil, and ignorant, then, Dr. King said, their case was made. They would have proven that freedom was dangerous in the hands of inferior beings. That was the ideological subtext of their interpretation of black reconstruction. Then Dr. King went on to say, one generation after another of Americans were assiduously taught these falsehoods, and the collective mind of America became poisoned with racism and stunted with myths. Understanding Reconstruction and its rollback is pivotal to understanding the history of race relations in America historically, but also what we see unfolding in our society since the day Donald Trump was sworn in as President of the United States. A dark day, ladies and gentlemen, in American history. Even black people don't know that much about Reconstruction. In Finding Your Roots, I did the family tree of John Lewis, and one of my heroes. I showed him the voter registration card for his great-great-grandfather from Alabama. He registered in 1867, 
And then I looked at him and I said, John, by my calculation, no one in your fa on your family tree voted between your great-great-grandfather in 18, he voted in 1868 for Ulysses S. Grant. No one in your family line voted between your great-great-grandfather and the passage of the voting rights in 1965 because of the rollback to Reconstruction. John stared at me, and you've seen it on TV, his head, boom, just fell to the table, and he wept, wept like a baby. Chris Rock, What's Chris, how can you compare Chris Rock and John Lewis? <laughs> well, I also did Chris Rock's family tree. I showed him the fact that his great-great-grandfather was elected <clears throat> a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives in 1872. And he looked at me and he said, if I had known this as a kid, this would have changed my life. And I thought it was a joke, you know, because he's so funny. He said, no, no, I'm not joking. I went to my mother and said, I want to grow up and be a politician. And she said, black men can't grow up to be politicians because of the nature of American racism. And he said, had he known that, it would have changed the whole course of his career. And then he wept like a baby. So I wanted to um, do a film and write a book restoring our consciousness about Reconstruction because it's been lost to history. I'll give you a couple highlights and then a couple uh, summaries of the downside and then we'll open it up for questions. Remarkable, brilliant highlights that we forget. <clears throat> the redefinition of citizenship and the rights of black people and all Americans through civil rights laws and constitutional amendments. The 13th Amendment ratified December 6, 1865, abolished slavery. It wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation that abolished slavery. It was the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, ratified in 1868, established birthright citizenship. You ever wonder why America is one of the places where if you're passing through and you happen to have a baby, the baby is automatically a citizen? Because Charles Sumner and the abolitionists couldn't figure out how to make these former slave citizens. And they came up with birthright citizenship for that reason. It was brilliant. Due process, equal protection of the law, all that is in, enshrined in the 14th Amendment. And the 15th Amendment, which gave black men um, the right to vote. And even before the 14th and 15th Amendments, there were key acts of Congress. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 passed over Andrew Johnson's veto. It, it uh, first established birthright citizenship, which then becomes a constitutional amendment, and stated that black people must enjoy the same rights as white people. And it granted federal officials the authority to prosecute anyone who violated this new law. That law remains on the books today. And then Congress passed four Reconstruction Acts in 1867 and 1868 over President Johnson's veto. And they carved the defeated Confederacy into five military districts and required them to hold elections for new constitutional conventions, which wouldn't be legitimate unless the former slaves, black men, were given the right to vote. And they also had to ratify the 14th um, Amendment. And that led to one of the most remarkable moments in the history of American democracy. I call it the first freedom summer of 1867. Ladies and gentlemen, 80% of those black men who were illiterate because it was illegal to teach a slave to read and write, 80% registered to vote. Think about that. And in the general election of 1868, they voted. 500,000 black men cast their votes for Ulysses S. Grant. Now Ulysses S. Grant carried the electoral college overwhelmingly, a landslide, but he won the popular vote by 300,000. 500,000 black men. Black men had elected a president of the United States. South Carolina, as Jim Clyburn said in the film, elected a black majority to its House of Representatives. This is three years after slavery ended when 90% of black people um, had been slaves and illiterate. Here's another shocking fact. There were three majority black states. South Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana were majority black, 
And Florida, Alabama, and Georgia were almost majority black. So the potential for black political domination, almost like a black republic within the republic, was seen as a very real threat to black power. Between 1870 and 1877, 16 black men are elected to the Congress, two to the United States Senate, and by 1900, there were a total of 20 black representatives um, elected to the House and two black men elected to the Senate. 2,000 black men were elected to public office at every level throughout the South. And the black community built schools, reunited families, built, um, built churches, and founded the historically black colleges and universities which thrive today. But these black games did not come without a cost. White supremacy morphed in the face of this manifestation of black power. It freaked people out. Nobody dreamed that these black men would actually take the perquisites of citizenship seriously. There were eight major massacres between 1866 and 1876, starting in Memphis in 1866 and culminating in Hamburg, South Carolina in 1877. 3,724 black men were lynched between 1889 and 1930. Slavery had ended, but cotton remained the leading export in the United States through the Great Depression, and somebody needed to pick that cotton, and they needed to pick, um, the, needed for those people, if not to be free labor, then almost free labor, and that led to the invention of sharecropping. And also the need for cheap labor led to vagrancy acts that allowed idle black men to be imprisoned and sentenced to work on a chain, chain gang. Then a conservative Supreme Court. The Supreme Court eviscerated the Reconstruction Acts. And every, as every lawyer in this room knows, through um, the, uh, a course called Crookshank in 1876, and then in 1883, it struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And starting in 1890, each southern state held their own constitutional convention, which was exclusively about disenfranchising those black men who could um, previously vote. Future Governor James Vardaman um, said in Mississippi, there is no use to equivocate, equivocate or lie about the matter. Um, Mississippi's Constitutional Convention was held for no other purpose than to eliminate the nigger from politics. Not the ignorant, but the nigger. That was 1890. And remember, Mississippi was the first state to send a black man to the United States Senate. And these constitutional conventions swept the South throughout the 1890s. And I'll give you one um, dramatic example of how effective they, of they were. In Louisiana, before their state constitutional convention in 1898, 130,000 black men could vote. After that state constitutional convention, by 1904, that number had been reduced precisely to 1,342. Then finally, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They were geniuses, and they had a, the historian general. Her name was Mildred Lewis Rutherford, and she published a book in the 1890s called The Measuring Rod. I made my students at Harvard study this book after I made them watch Birth of a Nation right in February when our semester started of this year. This book was sent to every library in the United States and to every teacher at a public school. And the, it had 20 guidelines for judging whether to buy or use a book about the Civil War and Reconstruction in their classroom. These were the high points, and I'm quoting, reject a book that says the South fought the war to hold on to her slaves. Reject a book that speaks of the slaveholder of the South as cruel and unjust. Reject a book that glorifies Abraham Lincoln Reject a book that says negative things about Jefferson Davis. You've heard about the Common Core? Their Common Core was the lost cause, and that effort led to the construction of so many 
of the Confederate monuments that we see today. Brian Stevenson, um, who, the subject of the great film you're about to see, Just Mercy, and who started the, the Museum of Freedom and Justice, I call it the Lynching Museum <laughs> down in Montgomery. He was quoted in Vox Magazine in 2017 as saying, I actually think the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude and forced labor. labor. The great evil of American slavery was the narrative we created to justify it. They made up this ideology of white supremacy that cannot be reconciled with our Constitution, that cannot be reconciled with the commitment to fair and just treatment for all people. They made it up so they could feel comfortable while enslaving other people. Slavery, Brian Stevenson concluded, didn't end in 1865, it just evolved. The North won the Civil War, but the South won the narrative war. Now it's time for us to change the narrative. We made this series to show that if we could get through, as a people, if we could get through the nightmare of the rollback of Reconstruction through the imposition of Jim Crow, the low point, the nadir in American race relations, then we collectively, ladies and gentlemen, those of us who love truth and justice, can get through this new surge of white supremacist rhetoric birtherism, the attack on affirmative action in the courts, gerrymandering and voter suppression, xenophobia and anti-immigrant feelings, the new nadir in American race relations that we are experiencing today. History repeats itself, but only if we let it. Thank you very much. <laughs>